Thank you for listening to this download of Start the Week, presented by Tom Sutcliffe. Hello. We're talking about strategic thinking this week. What Lawrence Friedman, Professor of War Studies at King's College London, doesn't know about this subject could be written on the back of a postage stamp. What he does know needs a lot more paper. He's just published Strategy, a panoramic 700-page history of mankind's long search for a reliable way to bend the future to its will. As a chess player, the journalist Dominic Lawson has an interest in move and counter-move too, and he'll soon be applying his strategic skills to a radio series in which he interviews well-known amateur players of the game while simultaneously trying to checkmate them. And David Runciman reflects on the strengths and weaknesses of democracies in crisis in his new book, The Confidence Trap. We start, though, with a case study of force projection and strategic failure, Shakespeare's Coriolanus, a new production of which is just about to open at the Donmar Warehouse in London, directed by that theatre's artistic director, Josie Rourke. Um, Josie, it's hard to think of a Shakespeare play that better exemplifies some of the ideas and the dilemmas that we're talking about today. Um, I'm sure that's not why you chose to do it. Why why Coriolanus now? No, uh, not to offer start that we can neat proposition, but um, uh, I've, it's always fascinated me as a play, I think principally because of his character and what he's struggling to do against the world he's within. I think it's also a play about politics. A lot of people have said that it feels very contemporary or very modern in what's not actually a modern production. I can't help but thinking that if you make the play clear, it would be modern at any point, given that its themes about the emergence of democracy, someone who is a potential demagogue within that, the conflict between militarism and what the Roman people might want, um, are never irrelevant, it seems. Did that um, provocative and disputed word pleb play any part in your thinking? Well, we were very... It suddenly got a resonance that uh, it didn't have a year ago. It or... has, yeah. And one of the things that happens in the production is that um, Anona Plebis, which is a corner her own price, is painted on the back wall of the theatre. So it's, it, it's there without... I mean, I, I, I think that its definition at the point at which Shakespeare was using it and its definition now has really changed. The word has moved and shifted, which doesn't mean that some of the debates around it, particularly the notion of what a patrician class is to a people, don't resonate. Well, it's odd, actually, because now you look at it and you think the contempt has swerved in the other direction, that the uh, that the people have more contempt for their their masters than the other way around, in some cases. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it varies from society to society, doesn't it? It's, it's quite... I think one of the things that one has to get one's head around when doing the play, and certainly this took up a lot of our first week of rehearsal, is an understanding that although Shakespeare is writing about early Rome, he's also writing about Jacobi in London. And that it's, you know, and there were the grain riots um, in uh, in the Midlands at that point, which sort of informed the beginning of the play to an extent, people think. Um, you know, there's another really interesting theory that it was his first sort of court theatre play. So it's one of the first indoor plays. So whereas one might imagine that it was done at the Globe with that the groundlings and that big audience, actually it was probably for a more expensive audience, uh, which which is fascinating. I mean, it's really hard to see where Shakespeare comes down. You know, it's a play that's been both staged and shut down by fascist regimes um, within its history. And and the incendiary nature of it, and certainly some of the incendiary discussions in the bar after just a few previews are totally... It, it, you're right that it's ambiguous, but it's it's not terribly ambiguous about the tribunes of the people, is it? I mean, they come off pretty, pretty badly, it seems to me, in the play. Well, I disagree with you, I think, because, you know, they are... It, it's got this sort of Jacobean plot where they contrive to bring Coriolanus down, but it's not a very heavy contrivance. All they need to do is set him on enough that his pride swells and he speaks his mind in a completely inappropriate context. I think there's a better question for me around that, which is how, and actually it's not a very good question for strategy, which is how much he actually wants to and feels that he should be a politician or want to be consul, which is what his family and his friends are pushing for. Um, through the first three acts of the play. He, what he really wants to do is get back on the battlefield and fight his celebrated rival. He's more of a soldier than he is a politician. I thought he was a very interesting performance. So you've got uh, Tom Hiddleston playing him. Um, much the mildest, gentlest Coriolanus. I mean, has all the arrogance and the fierceness, but there's a, there's a vulnerability about him which makes the ending of the play uh, much more poignant than I've ever seen it before, it seems to me. That's interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm pleased that you say that because, you know, he certainly, um, 
uh, to slightly misquote the play, hits the first three acts of it like a planet. You know, the um, the, the the rage that he comes on stage with and the contempt and all of those things that people necessarily associate with Coriolanus are there. But then the second half of the play, I think, has to yield a tragedy. And seeing as is the only named character who dies within it, it sort of has to be his, doesn't it? It has to be his. I thought he'd captured very much that um, fear that some very successful people have of praise uh, not because they have contempt for the people giving it, but because praise then sets up expectations. And that this, there's an element of that in him too, that he's he's fearful of what he's being required to do. Yeah, and this is a young Curry Lane in this production who, through this extraordinary act of heroism, is, is driven into consulship at a very early age. You know, it's, it's, it's clearly an ambition that other people have for him. How much he holds up for himself, I don't know. And I think that, you know... There's, there are other things going on within it when you talk about, um, you know, what one thinks about the tribunes necessarily. There's also just this sense of Roman society within Shakespeare's play that's completely obsessed with this athletic body of a soldier. You know, it's a play that famously talks about the stomach, talks about the body, talks about his wounds. This sense that in order to be successful, he has to show himself to the people and show them his wounds is something for which he has, although consul after consul has done it before him, perhaps a reasonable anxiety. Um, Lawrence Friedman, I want to bring you in because it was extraordinary re- watching the play after reading your book because he seems to perfectly exemplify this battle between two kinds of approach to war or to combat. Um, in your book, you write about the difference between um, B.A. and Metis, which is a cunning and brute force. And Coriolanus is all brute force, isn't he? Indeed he is. But, uh, and this, this tension between force and guile uh, is one that Shakespeare obviously picked up a lot and partly getting it from Machiavelli as well so it so it it goes back to the jacobean as well as the uh, as well as the classical sense of these two different approaches do you get what you want through just being more powerful tougher than everybody else or because you're not as powerful and tough having to find ways of being cunning and crafty uh, to deceive your opponents, which is the sort of thing that the noble warrior is not supposed to like. Uh, because... Yeah, I was very interested in your book, the, um, the definition of plot, and when mm. that came into the language as something that was negative and the distinction between having a plot and having a plan. Yeah. And when the tribunes march into the Senate and say he's overturned, uh, that, that, that the election is overturned and that the people don't want him for consul, one of the first things Coriolanus um says is that this is a plot and the Tribune immediately says call it not a plot it's the people yes I mean, it goes back to, to Guy Fawkes basically <laughs> yeah, but Corinne Lannis also has that sense that it is dishonourable to go by indirection doesn't it Volumnia his, his mother yes. has to le- read him a lecture on how it says it's not in fact dishonourable to kind of get your way with soft words at one point yeah I'm interested uh, in Lawrence's point about brute force versus cunning because of course this is the modern battle in the strategy of chess, because the computer is brute force, and indeed technically it is called brute force. It is just massive transistorization, exhaustive uh, machine-like calculation, whereas we humans are not so good at that, uh, not nearly, but we do have cunning. We do have cunning, and uh, of course now brute force has, has, has beaten cunning, but still it, it, it is that almost two different approaches to the same thing. Um, and the human, of course, is much more interesting, and Shakespeare could write about that. Brute force is not very interesting. Well, it's rather... Um, David Runsman, you write a little bit about the way in which we slowly change, you know, from this idea that guile and, and statecraft is somehow dishonourable to it becoming a great virtue uh, uh, and sort of one of the democratic virtues. Is yeah, absolutely, to... and I think all democracies are conflicted in the way that this story brings out in that... They want things from their leaders, including brute force, actually, that democratic peoples are attracted to leaders who have some of the qualities that then democracy is designed to rein in. And that conflict goes on all the time. And in all ways, on both sides of the divide, the conflict runs runs through modern democracy. I think one, one of the tensions in it is that it's often being very crafty or even using brute force is a great thing to do on your opponents, but not a very good thing to do with your own people. Uh, and and the, the uh, mm. uh, one one of the reasons Odysseus, who sort of introduces this idea in Homer, uh, or exemplifies it, uh, he, he's he's very clever with with, uh, with the Trojans, uh, but nobody actually believes him when he's talking to their own people. 
And David I've always Ransom. found one of the haunting moments in the play when he uses brute force on his people, when he banishes them. They banish him and he says, I banish you. And all <laughs> democratic politicians must have a moment where they wish on election night when they've been rejected, they can say, well, I reject you. But of course they can't because they're politicians. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, this is very clearly a soldier in the Senate and what makes him a great soldier, which is that there is no gap between thought and action. And, and you know, through rehearsals, we're saying actually he's much more like a star striker than he is a, a team captain in that sense. You know, he's the guy you send out just to um, <laughs> score the goals that you need. You know, he's not the general of the army. In but that it's sense. interesting, isn't it? Because the moment at which he bursts through the gates in Corrali, um it's an insane act. It's, it, it's not the act of a sane soldier. Um, it is suicidal. And that moment of shock is presumably part of the reason that he carries it off, is that the, his opponents can't believe he's actually done it. Yeah, which is, and, and strategies of shock and surprise and deception are the things you can probably only do once. Uh, I mean, it's a shock the first time they do it, but if they try to do it again, they'll be ready for him. Uh, so and that's, one, again, one of the problems of the trickster uh, is that uh, when people have sussed you out, you, you can't carry on doing that way. I think the other thing about Coriolanus, and I guess you could say with Othello as well, and, and it is this um, sharp dichotomy between the traits considered necessary to be the successful general, the successful military leader, and those considered necessary to be the successful politician. Whereas now you would say the modern general has to be pretty political, mm. uh, not only in his ability to uh, work his way through uh, the, the government and, uh, and the alliances that they have to be part of, uh, but also the situations which they're trying to interpret are, are very complex and, and require the, the uh, clear poli you know, political understanding to do that. Um, well, you uh, write about in th this in your book. Um, it has been uh, seems compulsory to use the word magisterial in all of the reviews I've read so <laughs> far, and I can understand what they mean because you cover everything. You cover from evolutionary theory to uh, the telling of stories in themselves. And your starting point is the, the spread of this word strategy, mm -hmm. the fact that everybody wants to have mm -hmm. one, everybody claims to have one, even the smallest council yeah. in the country. Um, now, you're trying to kind of restrict the definition back a little bit. What's your Well, I'm trying definition? to do two things, I think, but partly uh, what's a useful way of using the word, but also that it isn't a magic ingredient that will solve all your problems. Uh, the, the, the people, uh, it's an easy thing to say to a government or to a, the head of an organisation, oh, what you really need is a strategy, as if that's going to make everything coherent and s give you a way forward uh, in a way that you just haven't been able to see it before. Whereas in practice... Uh, a strategy is an attempt to solve the problems that you face and you may face a number of problems at once and uh, the way forward may not be clear your main problem may just be surviving not not uh, uh, not not uh, creating a, a better situation so uh, it's part it's partly to, to limit it so it's a useful thing but it, but it is also just to, to warn that it's it's an important thing to have but a very difficult thing to do um, a strategy isn't just a long-term plan though is it there's some, there's more to it than that you have to have some sense of conflict, some sense of an opponent. Well, it's not Even a plan. I mean, the, the basic line is it's not a plan. Uh, I mean, it may have planning as part of it to implement it, uh, but the point about a plan is that you can follow a sequence of events to your eventual goal, whereas um, the point about strategy is conflict, that, that, that you're dealing with other willful beings who've got their own ideas, uh, their own agendas, and it's the interaction with them, which, of course, is one of the links with chess, uh, is that you're... Uh, you're having to anticipate what others might do as, w as well as uh, just press on with, with your own ideas. Uh, so you know, the, the line which, um, with which the book opens from, from Mike Tyson, which seems to have attracted as much attention as anything else in the book, is everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the throat. Yeah, it's a great, um, a great epigraph. I mean, it's a version of that very famous... Uh, the von Malka von Malka, line, uh, yeah. no plan survives contact with the enemy. Much more, much, Tyson. much livelier, yeah. <laughs> um, there's a sort of self-deception at the heart of a lot of strategy, isn't there? I mean, that's one of the interesting things you write about, that they are, it is a very seductive idea, and this maybe explains why it has spread uh, so well, wide, it, is that we, we like to think that we can control well, the future. I think we're clever we... strategists. And I think it goes back to the earlier discussion about guile and cunning. Um, and it's one of, the popular, one of the reasons for the popularity of Sun Tzu, the, 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 the Chinese uh, writer, uh, who is all for deception uh, and surprise, is it, it pays to a conceit that we can be cleverer. We, we can win just by being cleverer than everybody else. Uh, uh, and 
the, the, the stupid lumbering enemy won't understand what we're doing, which is fine if you're maybe if you're fighting a, a computer, but if you're fighting somebody else who's also read Sun Tzu, uh, you can have a problem because uh, you, you can neutralize each other's moves quite easily. And that seems to have happened quite a lot in China as well in the past. So it, it, it's the it, 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 it's a nice idea. That, that just by thinking, outthinking our opponents, we, we, we can always uh, neutralise, uh, negate their, their advantages in, in resources and raw power. Um, one of your shortest and pithiest um, just definitions of it is um, it is about creating power. You're le- it's an act of leverage, isn't it, essentially a good strategy? Yeah, I mean, if to, you, th- if you think m- that we go into most conflicts with, with a sort of a pot of power, um, and if we're fighting somebody or uh, dealing with somebody who's, who's got more of it than ours, the good strategy is one that, that uh, uh, helps you bridge that gap. Uh, it, it adds to your pot of power. Uh, and, and that, if, if it succeeds, but if it's not so good, it can subtract from it as well. Um, your book, the beginning of the book, 250 pages, is about what I suppose you would you'd conventionally think of as strategy, Clausewitz and mm. Liddell Hart and, and the way in which battles were fought. Uh, but the huge bulk of the book is about um, strategy from below, which is revolutions, and strategy from above, which is is management. Um, is it our admiration for military men? Why is it that military men set the set the tone for for the way in which we solve our problems? Well, the, the, I mean, the word strategy comes from the art of the general, so that's why uh, that's uh, and it, it was introduced in a military context, but it was soon, I think, found useful in other contexts and. Uh, Politically, amongst revolutionaries, were always trying to work out strategies, and they probably talk more about strategies than any, everybody else because the gap between what they've got and where they're trying to get to is so large. Uh, so they have to think about it a lot, and then they have big arguments about strategy. Um, so uh, uh, I think one of the interesting things now is that most writing on strategy is in business, uh, and the relationship between a business strategy and a military strategy. Uh, I don't think it's that great in terms of what we were saying before, in terms of a modern military strategy has to be very politically astute. You'd argue that's true with a modern business strategy. But when business strategists tend to look at military, they, they, it's, it's about being very macho and, and decisive and, and following the, the leadership lessons of Napoleon or Alexander the Great or something, uh, and, and often gets them into trouble as a result. Um, well, that's one of the interesting things about the book, isn't it, that no strategy will persist forever because you either come up against a situation like the invention of the atomic bomb which utterly changes all of the rules that are that are applied to this particular game, and then suddenly we get into game theory as well. Um, that was very interesting. I thought that they, at the moment of gravest danger, we come onto the notion of playing a game, and that's what gets us out of trouble. It's a, it's a way of dealing with the horror in an abstract sort of way. That that if you actually try to think about moves involving nuclear weapons in a in a sort of sensible reasonable rational way you you're paralyzed but if you put them as in a, in a two by two matrix uh, and uh, uh, and you, you call it prisoner's dilemma or a game of chicken or something like that you you can then start to think through uh, what it actually uh, could mean come up with some counterintuitive ideas which actually if you look back at people like Tom Schelling were quite productive I mean they, they came to useful and sensible conclusions partly about uh, uh, the impossibility of winning a nuclear war through through this means. So it, it, it uh, although others came to uh, more dangerous conclusions. So, but it can be quite a productive way of thinking. But it was a wheel a way of dealing uh, with with the horror without actually talking about the horror all the time. And is that the moment at which strategy really breaks out into the world of commerce? Because you've got these clever, brilliant men at the Rand Corporation and various other places, and and brilliant mathematicians applying their minds to this. I think game theory. Um, Actually, was probably much more influential outside of uh, outside of the military arena than it was within. It's it's probably exaggerated the role it played within, but outside it, it influenced economics and business strategy considerably. Um, David Runciman, I mean, uh, your your texts overlap in a, in a large number of cases in this. You write about Schelling as well. In I your do, book. and about politics as poker. One of the things I found so fascinating about Lawrence's book is there's a temptation in politics to, to take the military route, mm. but also the other temptation, the sort of technocratic route, which is to think that the best strategy is to be insulated from conflict and to keep it kind of pure. Mm. And you bring out the full range of dangers of that because you've got to keep testing it. The classic idea is leadership from the front running up against conflicting wills. And there is a temptation in contemporary politics, I think, to try and withdraw 
And that's the danger of technocracy. And I think also one of the, one of the attractions of game theory, economic theory, um, was that uh, here was a social science route yeah. to provide the right answers to our policy problems uh, that uh, got away from mucky politics. Uh, and you say the, the the need to test it and to actually see whose interests are going to be affected by by particular moves. I think, moves. I think um, the, 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 well, the Rand Corporation, they many American wars were based on their planning, which were which were not good, and 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 you know I think that the planning is hugely overestimated. I mean, it's sometimes said about in chess, it's better to have a bad plan than no plan at all. This is completely wrong. It's much better to have no plan at all, and I think that. Uh, the idea, I know that, uh, for example, uh, if, if your opponent plays a bad move, which you don't understand, you don't understand it, and you think there may be a plan behind it, you don't understand, actually it may mean that it's a very bad plan, and that a bad move is actually the introduction to a worse move, and after that it's an introduction to a still worse move. And planning, I think, is a great disaster in many ways, well, because you, you improvisation may, you, is the key. You quote Eisenhower, don't mm. you, who has a rather brilliant formulation. Well, the, 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 uh, Plans are useless, planning's essential. Mm. Uh, that it's necessary to think through, uh, but I don't think... Um, I mean, what you say is true. It's much harder to get into the mind of your opponents who are from, from different cultures, different mm. backgrounds, and therefore you're more likely to make mistakes by trying to overread them. Mm. Uh, and one of the hardest things, even for an intelligence agency, is when your opponent yeah. is being stupid because you never actually believe that's what's happening. Exactly. That's um, one of the advantages democracies have, that sometimes they're extremely stupid and it throws off their, yeah. their more clear-sighted enemies. Um, you write very interestingly at the end of the book about narrative. I mean, yeah. literally about Hollywood scripts mm. and, and the way a script and a, a narrative is, is drawn up. I thought that, I, again, I was sitting in Coriolanus thinking, that's exactly what this story is about. It's a man trapped by a narrative, a, a narrative which was useful up to a certain point and has then enclosed him completely. I, I think that's right. And, and it's interesting just to be looking at this material while I'm directly in production for Coriolanus because the aspect that doesn't necessarily appear is a kind of deep aspect of psychology where you go he's a man who's been driven by the death of his father the desire of his mother to have him achieve you know the the family group that he's within which is his improvised family and and actually his behavior is much more is, I mean he has no strategy Coriolanus you know I mean that that's why he goes into Coriolis on his own that's why the minute someone does something remotely irritating to him he flies off the handle he's utterly unstrategic well, he has no, he has none of that ability to think four moves ahead, does he? He think he's living in the instant all yeah. the time. Um, I'm I'm going to turn to you, Dominic Lawson, because you're um, very much concerned with the ability to think four or five or six, maybe even more moves ahead. You're going to uh, be presenting a series called Across the Board, which is conversations conducted while you actually play chess. Um, now, that obviously limits your interviewee pool to people who play chess. Is there something psychologically that connects amateur chess players? Are they a certain type of people? Um, well, it's, it's competitive, uh, so they're competitive people. Uh, no one plays chess except to win, and you have to really enjoy it. And um, uh, someone once said that chess was a sort of conflict between the pain of thinking and the pain of losing. Um, and you have to absorb a lot of pain in thinking, because it is painful to think hard, I think. Um, but winning is so pleasurable to you, you're prepared to go through this pain. Um, and so, yes, and also I think there is, well, to me at least and many others, there is an aesthetic to chess, and it's highly geometric, and I think it's very hard to be keen on chess unless at some level uh, it appeals to you just as pure beauty as, as art. I mean, it, it's possible not to, but I've never met a keen chess player, man or woman, who doesn't get a certain frisson from what he or she sees as a beautiful move. Um, there's a chicken and egg question here, isn't there? I mean, two of your interviews, you're interviewing Rachel Reeves, a politician, uh, Lennox Lewis as well, the boxer. Does their interest in chess and their playing of chess make them a better politician and a better boxer? Or are they bringing those qualities to the chessboard? Well, I think Lennox Lewis certainly it informed his boxing. And, of course, the boxing is like a chessboard. It's a, it's a, a ring. And just as in chess, you have to control the centre of the board, either directly or indirectly. So you have to control the centre of the ring. Um, you have to cut off the options. You get them into a corner. In chess, you're hunting the king. You're putting the king into a corner. And I think Lennox Lewis, I think to the frustration of many of his managers who wanted him to be a bit more 
brute more brute force and <laughs> he and and but actually i asked him in the interview about about tyson and and you know you mentioned tyson you know the, his sort of violent interpretation and actually lennox said uh, tyson was very easy to box because he only came forward you knew before the game before the match he wasn't going to go left he wasn't going to go right he wasn't going to retreat he was just going to come at you and it's very easy in fact to, if you're intelligent to prepare you just know so you think well okay i know what he's going to do and and I can prepare for that. And much of chess, actually, nowadays, what you see on the board is a tiny amount of the work, a tiny amount. The preparation is enormous. And, of course, boxing, I think, certainly, the, you know, that goes on for months, the preparation. The actual bout can be over in 30 seconds if, uh, very easily. And so and you don't see that sometimes when you play chess. And, and uh, certainly with Rachel Rees, I, she struck me as she's a very, very thoughtful uh, woman, uh, immensely hard working. Everything is very considered. I mean, she is, you know, in some ways a classical chess player um, uh, and, and very competitive. Um, you're obviously competitive. You play at a, a county level yourself. Mm. Uh, you had an edge here, didn't you? You could always throw in a curveball question. At, at a critical moment, did you did you do that to win? At uh, any yes, point? mercilessly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Um, and in fact, Rachel would complain. Uh, I mustn't just steal too much, but she she I think got quite annoyed, <laughs> quite annoyed at this, and said, "Oh, this isn't fair." Um, yes, but on the other hand, um, I had to write down all the moves, and I you know had to think up uh, responses to the, you know because it's a dialogue. It's not just question answer question and there's a flow to it so yeah we were participating in in a chess struggle and a, and a verbal struggle um, you said earlier that um, you talked to the beauty of the chessboard and, mm. and a lot of chess players do that what does it say about it though that it's one of the the only higher order human activities that a computer can prevail at a compute computers write very dull novels they write very very boring music though they can do it but a computer, well, can, moment, computer moment, can play. I mean, good... that may not always be the case. Uh, I mean, because I, I, the development is so astonishingly rapid, and uh, so we, uh, uh, and you know Moore's law shows that the things have developed at a sort of at an astonishing rate. Um, so I could see, in fact, a computer writing a wonderful novel. Or I mean, we, if we knew it was a computer, we might be less interested in it. Um, that that's the trick, and this is the whole Turing thing of well, do you know it's computer? Well, I was going to say I was going to bring mm. in Turing because mm. essentially a computer can now pass the Turing test as long as chess is the language. Uh, yes, which only means I think the Turing test is not a proper test <laughs> because actually we know it isn't quotes <laughs> thinking. Um, uh, so uh, I think it may refute the test. But yeah, Turing was one of the earliest chess programmers. Uh, Josie Rook, I mean, you, you, uh, you've had experience in this field only because you, you produced a play about yeah, my, exactly this subject. My previous project, uh, The Machine by Matt Sharman, was about Kasparov playing Deep Blue. And um, actually, my next project, uh, Privacy, which is about um, some of the issues around Snowden and whether or not anyone can be private in the modern world, I'm in this kind of place where, having looked at all this material for The Machine and thinking about artificial intelligence, you go, we're at a unique point in the history of data where, whereby it's possible to collect all this information about ourselves and for computers to process it so it can be stored and it can be processed and read. And, you know, Tesco Club Card knows when you're getting divorced. It's it, it, the, the yes, artificial so intelligence it, it is knows getting, you're pregnant before yeah, you do. Yeah, absolutely. That's cases, it's, yeah. We're, at, we're at a kind of tipping point where human behaviour can be inferred from its patterns, and that comes out of thinking strategically ahead and a lot of that early computing that went on around chess and around AI. I think um, it brings us back to this question of whether I mean you're a political columnist as well. You've been fascinated by politics. Is chess a good model for politics? Or no, no, not at and all. why? Why not? Well, politics is a, is, 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 is a team game. It's about you know, massive organisations with millions of voters. Um, chess is, is intensely solitary. Um, it's, it, it, it's very hermetic. Um, and I think, no, I think there is... And also, everybody knows everything all the time. Both players well, and... <laughs> te- yes, it is, it is, there is perfect information. Nothing is hidden. Um, on the other hand, because of its sheer complexity, that, en- that only takes you so far. Uh, and you're never, in certain positions, you could be absolutely certain, but a lot of the time you're in a sort of uh, a cloud of unknowing and you, you think you see a way through it, but you don't actually know. Um, do you feel intuition yourself? I was reading something about um, scientists doing neural um, tests on mm. grandmasters and they mm. found that grandmasters recognise a chess game like people recognise faces. Amateur players have to number crunch it. Yeah. Grandmasters well, have a sort of fun- sense and intuition. Fundamentally, it is all about pattern recognition. That's what it is. 
And you do that instantly. It's based on enormous study, but then it becomes intuitive. Um, and there was a very good book written last year, which was considered the best chess book of the year, by a Dutch master called Hendrix, which was called Move First, Think Later. Um, and actually, it was a brilliant book, because that is what happens. I mean, generally, with, with grandmasters, the very first move that occurs to them instantly is, in about 99% of the case, the right move. And Capablanca, who I think was probably the greatest chess of all time, used to say, well, very often he said, I think only one move ahead, it just happens to be the right move. Um, so it, it's, it is very intuitive, and I think that's where we're totally different from machines. But, um, but the, intu the, the intuition no, is very... Uh, uh, and it's what you get through experience, uh, having read a lot, having looked at how other people do it. It, it, it isn't, uh, it isn't just a sort of uh, uh, a random thing. It's very well informed intuition. Yes, it's yes. not magic. It's, it's not it? ma it's, yeah. it's come out of a. That's right. But when when the move occurs to you, it occurs to you in a in a in a sort of nanosecond. It's not a deliberative no, process. That, 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 that this is the sort yeah. of system one and system two thinking yes. of, of Kahneman. The, 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 yeah. the, 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 first, the first move, the, intu the intuitive move, is the one that's actually got far more processing in it than, than the more deliberative moves that come, the, 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 where you have to really dredge it up from, from, from your brain. Yeah. Um, David Runciman, um, you write in your book at one point, um, not being able to play chess gave the democracies an unseen edge. You're talking, I think, about the, the Cold War. Yeah. Uh, what did you mean by that? Well, in the Cold War, there was this end endless debate about whether it's a game of chess or whether it's a game of poker. Although in the end, various people concluded following Schelling it was a game of chicken and that was <laughs> where the democracy <laughs> had the advantage because in the game of chicken it really helps yeah. that the other side can't read you and the, the erratic quality of democratic life. But the, the, the real fear was if it's a game of chess, the Russians are going to win. Poker's the American game. Mm. American play, presidents play poker. So that should be an advantage. But democracies can't bluff because too much is out in the open. And there was a real fear, particularly in the early 60s, the period I wrote about, which is, if it's a game of chess, we're going to lose. If it's a game of poker, we're going to lose. Luckily, it was a game of politics. And that's neither chess nor poker. Well, luckily, though it sounds bizarre to say it, um, both sides realised that nobody could win. You yeah. know, that if you've got atomic weapons going off, everybody loses. What... And there was a deep human element to the interaction, and it's that crucial human element. I mean, again, it, going back to what we were talking about, the thought of a computer playing politics is a pretty terrifying thought, precisely for the reason that you can't be sure that the signals will be read, and it's absolutely crucial. Of course, the, scary, the scariest... Uh... Uh, war game and movies like that yeah. are all based on the idea that a computer has taken over uh, because they're the only ones who can be trusted. Just following the purely rational strategy <laughs> to destruction. Yeah. Yeah. But, but in David's book, he has a very interesting chapter on the Cuban Missile Crisis, mm. and of course, uh, Khrushchev was actually bluffing. He, mm. you know, so he was a bad poker player, but he was also a bad chess player because the missiles on Cuba were like a past pawn that has become <laughs> detached from the rest of your forces, which is a grade-A blunder. Um, so he was neither a good chess player nor a good poker player. He put them there because his bluff had been called. Yeah. Yeah. Did he know, though? I mean, one of the, uh, the uh, startling things in that chapter, um, David Runciman, is that at the, this moment of huge crisis for the world... Uh, Kennedy was worrying about midterm elections. And yep. he was thinking, well, if, what I do next is going to affect my results in the midterm yeah. election. Now, that is it's terrifying. the key to your book, isn't it? Yeah, in a way, it's a, the, the key feature of democracies is they always lack a sense of perspective. And in many ways, it looks like a hideous disadvantage. But in other ways, the constraint of that gives them the ability to, to act in ways. I say that Khrushchev, in some senses, suffered from the tyranny of choice. Kennedy, I think, deliberately boxed himself in. One of the things that he did was he went public which he didn't need to do, and lots of the high strategists were telling him this is a back-scenes game you should be playing. He went public, he brought in not just American opinion, but world opinion. It constrained him, it toughened him. He uh, was a genius at the game of politics. But yeah. it also, it, that, con that, con disagree. that constraint then made things more difficult for Khrushchev because Khrushchev knew he was constrained to a certain well, no, I, I just I don't disagree, but I, th I think the congressional elections were critical to the whole, uh, to Khrushchev's strategy as well, because mm. Khrushchev's idea was that he was going to announce these things after November, after the November elections, when he thought that, that Kennedy would be then able to do the deal on Berlin that, that he wanted him to do. So, uh, and, and the reason that Kennedy was so cross with Khrushchev uh, was because Kennedy had, had, had spoken publicly that he didn't think Khrushchev was going to do this. So you can't detach it from, from, from the politics of American democracy Absolutely. at the time. Uh, I want to come back to your book, The Confidence Trap, because essentially it's about a paradox, isn't it, that um, democracies seem to be quite good at surviving crises, 
But the crises keep on coming. They do. And we can't be sure that we, they will always survive them. So just could you just explain a little bit the, 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 the central... Yeah, in a way, the, the confidence trap is simply that you, for democracy to work, you have to have confidence in it. And one reason you have to have confidence in it is at any given moment, it often looks like it's not working. And if you look, as I've done at the history of the last 100 years, you can always find someone, even in the good years, saying this thing doesn't work. Because there's chaos on the surface, there's partisanship, there's mess. So you've got to believe it, in it in the long run. But believing in something in the long run constrains you, constrains the way you think. And in a way, it relates to the point about narrative in Lawrence's book, that you can then evolve a kind of narrative which says we'll always get out of whatever mess we get into because we've got this long history of muddling our way out of crises. And at some point, you're going to encounter the crisis that doesn't fit that pattern. We haven't encountered it yet. It would be crazy to think the next 100 years will follow this neat pattern of stumbling into crises and muddling our way out of them. Um, you focus specifically on seven specific crises. I mean, things like the end of the First World War um, uh, and, uh, you know, a moment at which democracy genuinely thought it was in trouble because yeah. it couldn't apply pressure in the way the German autocracy could. Yeah. How did they... How did they get out? I mean, what was the what was the advantage that democracy gave them in the end? I think the advantage was adaptability. Tocqueville has this great line, which is: democracies make more mistakes than they correct more mistakes. That is, yeah. they don't get more, st- more fires get started, more, more fires, fires get, get put, put out. out. Yeah. The autocracies might make fewer mistakes because they have the advantage of decisiveness; they can corral their forces. But when they make a mistake, they tend to get stuck with it, mm. and that's the crucial difference. In the First World War, you saw it. People forget 1918. There was real panic on the Western side in the United States. London and Paris. People thought Paris was going to fall. And it turned around very quickly. It, it, it seems in retrospect that the democracies adapted their way out of the mistakes they made during the First World War. But what I suggest in the book is then what you get is the moment of truth where people think, ah, democracy's won. We can seize our moment. We can create a world safe for democracy. They keep adapting. So they, they stumble their way out of their mistakes. They stumble their way out of their victories. Too. And another of the problems here, isn't it, as well, is that we've, we've moved from an area of kind of a, 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 re, a, a time of Uh, sovereign states and national politics to international politics. And because electorates don't overlap, it's very difficult for democratic politicians to to make any larger scale solution. Yeah, the the seizing of the moment is harder than ever. And you see in democracies now, as you have over the last 100 years, this sense among democratic electorates that their politicians don't feel like they're up to the task because they're so obsessed with what the electorate is thinking they they can't reach out. International politics complicates and confuses the picture, but it also creates those kind of conflicts which forces the democratic politicians to look outside of the box occasionally. So democracies do still have that underlying adaptability. It's not, it's not a story of disaster by any means, but it's getting more complicated. What makes you think we're at a watershed moment now? Is it just that we've got away with it for this long and well, <laughs> it can't carry on? We've got away with it this long, but 100 years, again, is not a long time. When you, when you take the big view, the grand view, 100 years into Athenian democracy, it looked OK because it was, as scholars now say, the most adaptable system in the ancient world, 200 years in, it was over. I mean, yeah, I think this, it, it, it all follows from science. I mean, it, it, Darwinism is, is, is not the survival of the strongest. It's the survival of the most adaptive. Um, in business, that is certainly the case, that the businesses, you know, huge, mighty businesses collapse because they're insufficiently adaptive. Um, the reason why Jobs and Apple were so successful is he would destroy his darlings. You know, they would, they would, they would scrap a product, even when it was still sitting, go to another one. That constant energy which democracy has, I think it, it, it fits in with what we understand about evolutionary success, which is why democracies, I think, are evolutionary. They're adaptive in evolutionary terms, and that is why... They last. But, but because it's a human activity in which people also tell themselves stories about their inadaptability, there are real pitfalls and traps, which is to have that faith that adaptability will win out in politics can produce a kind of blinkered approach where you don't look far enough, you don't look over the horizon, because you assume you will, you will adapt your way through. And there must be a risk yeah. that the belief in the adaptability yeah. of democracies yeah. is actually a spatial flaw. But contrast it, say, with, with, with China, oh, where sure. you have the belief in strategy, the plan, and you have the one-child policy, which has been a colossal disaster, and which they still are finding incredibly difficult to get away from, even though all their economists yeah. are saying to them, you know, this is insane, but no, this is the plan. I mean, there's, there's actually debate Lawrence going on at the moment about China's air defence zone. Mm-hmm. Uh, is this clever strategy... Uh, or is it a major miscalculation? It's very hard to tell at the moment uh, as, as to whether they really understood what they were doing because the main thing they've achieved so far is put every other country 
in the region in connection with each other to form alliances mm. that wouldn't necessarily have been there before. But maybe they're just being very patient and assume that by asserting their control over this area, it'll work out in the end. So the, 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 there's uh, often you can only see in retrospect where, whether a view was really clever. Uh, long-term strategy of move or, or actually was a series of sort of random responses that turned out well in the end. Um, you quote um, Kenneth Arrow, um, an economist who won a Nobel Prize, for suggesting that democracies were inherently unstable. Now, presumably you don't believe that. I mean, Dom- Dominic Lawson, you don't believe democracies are inherently unstable, do you? Well, no, because you, you have a pressure valve, um, which is elections. The problem with non-democracies is it can be absolutely fine, but how do you have a change of government without massive bloodshed? This has been the problem in Syria. You know, you know it's not on a day-to-day basis that democracy is better. It's how, do you, how does the transfer of power actually happen? And, 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 we, and we can now see globally how lethal it is when there isn't some kind of agreed means of transferring power. And one of the reasons I quote Arrow was he said that back in the 50s and it was pointed out to him in the 2000s that democracy was doing fine. And he said it's only 50 years. <laughs> the instability is just getting going. But, but I do agree when you take these long views, democracies are facing some very, very serious challenges. But over the next 100 years, the thought that Chinese technocratic state capitalism is not going to make at least one mistake that it can't get out of would also be extremely wishful, I think. Um, uh, (laughs) There's this very interesting thing as well about um, the the temptation to go for autocracy. A wonderful chapter where you write about um, George Bernard Shaw and John Maynard Keynes looking with certain wistfulness towards Mussolini's Italy. Uh, is Absolutely. Th- that's clearly a danger that we face it's, now as well. It's a perennial it? feature. Putin is the example now. We look at him, we see him stripped to the waist and hunting wildlife, and we think, well, our politicians aren't like that. Democracies always have that pull towards the thing they can't have, which is the macho, hard man politician who's going to get stuff done. Yeah. But it's which a fatal where temptation. Cori, yeah, yes. Where Coriolanus comes in again. Yeah, this unbelievably passionate argument by Coriolanus, um, in, during which the course of which he mars his fortune in Act 3, where he says, purpose so barred it follows nothing is done to purpose, in reference to the idea that there might be some form of democratic representation. It was very, very hard for us, rehearsing that play, to imagine that there had not been such a thing as Western liberal democracy when Shakespeare was writing it, um, or indeed in Rome. I'm going to have to stop you there, because we're running out of time, I'm afraid. Um, thank you to all of my guests. Josie Rook's production of Coriolanus is on at the Donmar Warehouse until February, and there's a National Theatre Live cinema showing at the end of January. David Runciman's The Confidence Trap and Lawrence Friedman's Strategy are both out now. Dominic Lawson's series of chess interviews across the board starts on BBC Radio 4 on the 30th of December at 1.45. We'll find out then when they're won. Next week, Andrew Marr talks to the writer Clive James, but for now, thank you and goodbye. There's more information about Start the Week on the programme's website. Go to bbc.co.uk where you'll also find many more Radio 4 programmes you can download for free.